Two years ago, reading after reading the Killer Angels and then watching Ken Burns' The Civil War series, eventually nine times, I went hook, line, and sinker into Civil War studies, followed immediately by asking my mom and dad if we had any Civil War ancestors. How many of you have done that? I wonder if, you're, if you had anybody that was there. I also quickly became interested in friends' Civil War ancestors, wondering if any of them were on the same battlefields as my own family members. The first friend I did some research for was Gary Lehman back when I lived on the Oregon coast in the 1990s. I discovered that Gary's ancestor, Silas Canfield, was captain of the 21st Ohio, who also wrote the regimental history book published in 1893. It turns out Gary's great great gramps in the 21st Ohio fought just 200 yards from my own great gramps in the 78th Illinois in those final hours of the Battle of Chickamauga, the second biggest battle of the Civil War. Fast forward some 25 years, my wife Joyce and I are coming home from grocery shopping and on comes a radio news report with a soundbite from Wyoming Congressman, Congresswoman Liz Cheney. Representing the January 6th panel, she's talking about the Civil War ancestor of hers named Samuel Cheney, her great-great-grandfather of the 21st Ohio. And the, she references Silas Canfield, the historian of the 21st Ohio. My, my friend Gary's, uh, I immediately turned to Joyce as we we're driving, I said, that's my friend Gary's ancestor. I came home to a hugely excited message from Silas Canfield's great-grandson, my buddy Gary, asking if I'd heard Liz Cheney mention his grandfather, Silas. Gary knew I'd get what a big deal it was. I don't think he even contacted his brother and his family before he contacted me, he was so excited. Well, I've often wondered if old Silas could have ever dreamed his words would be quoted to millions of Americans 160 years after the war ended. Samuel Cheney, by the way, has something in common with all of us, a regional tie. He was born in Boston, New Hampshire. Uh, he was married in Boston and later moved to Ohio when he joined the 21st Ohio. This little story I've just told you about my friend Gary happened simply by me being curious about a friend's ancestor. But I never had the opportunity to research ancestors of somebody famous until, by a cool twist of fate, I was able to tell Academy Award winner Kevin Cosner how his ancestor was in the Civil War. Now, how the heck did I ever have a chance to meet Kevin Cosner? Well, after wrapping up a 30 year career as a publisher of two water sports magazines, a longtime advertiser of mine, knowing I was a history nut, called me and told me, You gotta call my brother Bill Worland about this new venture he's doing, which I did and was one of the first writers that the company hired. I began working for this Cosner partnership in November of 2018. Kevin's new series, Yellowstone, many of you have seen that, I'm sure. It had just debuted, it was only four months old at that time. Among the three partners I worked closest with, Bill Worland was the one that really started the whole thing and it was his idea to do this app uh, that is, uh, at the time was called Here Here, now it's called Audio, A-U-T-I-O, it's on Apple uh, uh, Store and everywhere else. And here's how it works. Basically, anybody use navigation systems like Waze or other navigators on your car? Mm -hmm. As you're driving along, the navigator system will say, caution vehicle on the side of the road ahead. Instead of that, this GPS history, uh, history and, and information guide called Audio, gives you the history of South Dakota, Salisbury, San Francisco, Boston, whatever town you're going through, it basically reads the historical marker for you. And it tells you the history, we have Salisbury, we have a bunch of Newburyport, uh, and that's how it works. It's triggered automatically about a half a mile before you get to that historical marker or that his, uh, a famous mountain or waterfall or what have you. Well together, uh, Bill Worland and I, and soon followed by my wife Joyce, created the company's system of collecting and dishing out to writers the first 10,000 stories that are now on the app. Also, uh, our very own Roundtable Bill, uh, member, Bill Hallett, works for audio. He's a writer and a narrator, which doesn't surprise anybody because he has those 
round pear-shaped tones. He has that great vo radio voice, which is what they're looking for uh, to do that. So he writes as well as is the narrator of uh, many of the stories that we have on the app. Well, just a month into working for audio, I get a morning phone call from co-founder Bill Worthen. He's a real crack up. He's a great guy to work for. Uh, he's at the gate of Cosner's Santa Barbara Beach home. He goes, he says to me, hey, Rockstar, you might want to run a comb through your hair. You're going to meet Kevin in a couple minutes. I gulp, you know, I'm like, oh, okay. I didn't just comb my hair. I actually ran to the bathroom, I shaved, and I put on a collared shirt. Because in this day and age, you only have to look good from the waist up, right? On a Zoom call. So we, so even though everybody in California wears T-shirts, I'm wearing a collared shirt. So sure thing, minutes later, I'm on a video call with the three partners of audio who are sitting on the couch at Cosner's place, just like you see in this photo here. From left to right were company founders Woody Sears, Cosner, and Bill Worland. They sat with an ocean view at their backs. So not only am I looking at them, but I have to focus on not looking at the beautiful Pacific Ocean as we're, as we're talking about what we're gonna talk about with the company. After a quick introduction, to my surprise, Woody and Bill go silent as Kevin and I talk for 20 minutes. Kevin stressing that this could really be an important difference-making legacy project for all of us. Our contribution to increasing access to American history through new technology. And then Kevin asked me what I knew about the Fetterman fight in Wyoming. Anybody know about the Fetterman fight? I know Tom does. <laughs> I told him after the first time I ever went to Little Bighorn Battlefield, I had bought and devoured Stephen Ambrose's Custer and Crazy Horse book. And I, I read the book, it, in the book it talks about the Sioux Warriors luring 81 U.S. soldiers into an ambush. He then proceeded to dish out riveting details about the surprise encounter in which Civil War veteran Captain William Fetterman and all 80, every single one of his soldiers were killed by this ambush. Kevin's detailed story made me want to go there, and in fact, Joyce and I did on a uh, trailer trip we took a couple years ago. Uh, we went to the battlefield site. It hasn't changed one bit. It looks just like it did on that day in 1866. It's really, it literally, it's haunted, I'm sure, and it's very haunting to be there, knowing what, what happened. Whoop. I soon forgot I was talking to a very famous Hollywood actor as he schooled me in the aftermath of the Fetterman fight of 1866. Kevin described how the fort's commander, who by the way is from Connecticut, uh, had ordered, and he was a Civil War vet, had ordered that if the thousand plus Sioux combatants who had just demolished Fetterman's command were able to attack and break into Fort Phil Kearney, the compound's remaining skeleton crew of soldiers, along with officers, wives, and children, were ordered to be piled into the powder house magazine on the inner part of the, of the fort and blow themselves up. <laughs> True story. Cosner tells me this as we're sitting here having the Zoom call, and I, I did not know about that. I knew about the Fetterman fight, but I did not know about that. They knew of the atrocities the warriors would inflict. The Sioux felt that you had to dismember and obliterate your, your foe when you killed them because otherwise they would come back in their next life and attack you. So I learned a lot on that first meeting with Kevin Cosner. As a side note, I want you to study this is a beautiful uh, overview of the actual Fort Kearney. Um, I, uh, it, it just look at the inlet on the bottom right. You see the little uh, scalloped out half moon area. It actually conforms with the creek, Pliny Creek, with a guard house on either side so it could be manned by soldiers while the other soldiers went out and draw, drew water from the creek without being attacked. So it was well thought out. It was a 12-foot palisaded fort, which is uh, three foot deep in the hole in the ground. With it. So basically you have a nine-foot <coughs> high uh, a palisaded fortress. Um, it's one major weakness, however, Fort Phil Kearney, besides the fact that it's literally in the middle of nowhere, uh, is they had to go three miles to get the wood that was desperately needed to keep the fires burning in minus 50 degree winters and to continue building stables and other things uh, for the fort. 
So every time the, the, the wagoneers and the lumber and the soldiers went out to, to lump, get lumber three miles away, they, were, they fell prey to the, uh, to the Sioux attacks. So a few days after this meeting with Cosner, Audio co-founder Bill Worland asked me to try to connect with a history, a historic preservation organization that we might be able to work with in producing stories for our, our travel app. I've been a big fan of Gary Edelman's and the Battlefield Trust for years, and of course, as you all know, our roundtable donates to the American Battlefield Trust pretty much exclusively. So I figured, why not reach out to Gary? Of course, anytime you mention that this is a Kevin Cosner company, people perk up. Gary was excited to become involved in helping us produce audio stories. And I mentioned to Gary that I had done research as we talked and discovered that Kevin had a Civil War ancestor pension file and that his ancestor was a horse soldier. It was not lost on both of us that Cosner played a horse soldier in Dances with Wolves. Gary even wanted to take him on a tour of, of the battlefield, which is right here. Gary was intrigued and immediately sent one of his interns from their Washington, D.C. offices over to the National Archives. Uh, they dug up Cosner's great great gramps's file and sent me all 58 pages of pensioned military records, including the knowledge that his great gramps fought at the Battle of Dutton's Hill. That's in Kentucky, uh, Middle Kentucky. Uh, it was, it's depicted in this illustration. It's the only illustration I could find of the Battle of Dutton's Hill. Uh, and it really shows the mayhem of a Civil War fight, if you'll look at all the things that are going on. They're attacking the uh, Confederate uh, uh, position, the uh, cannon position there. Well, this is Kevin's uh, great great gramps's pension file. It's the index of the file that leads to you, who knows what. You, it could be five pages, it could be 100 pages. I also found Cosner's family tree online that showed his Civil War ancestor was 20 years old when the war broke out in 1861. His name was Charles Noel Mannering, and he served in Company M of the 7th Ohio Cavalry for three years. How many companies are there in the Civil War Cavalry Regiment? There's 12. How many in an inf infantry regiment? Ten. Ten. There's always, there's two more in a cavalry regiment, and I don't know why, I wish I could tell you. But there, there, that he was in Company M of the 7th Ohio Cavalry. He received pension money from Uncle Sam, and when he died, his widow, Anna Lisa, her maiden name was Burns, also received a monthly government check. Well, here is the Manning family tree. From the far left, you'll see below Cosner's photo, uh, uh, his, uh, Kevin's grandmother, Verna Manring, married his gramps, Clyde Tedrick. By the way, Clyde's grandfather, John F. Tedrick, served in the 111th Illinois Volunteers and was on the 1864 Atlanta Campaign. Don't worry, there's going to be some more Cosner uh, Civil War kin coming up too soon. Well, Cosner's mother, Sharon Ray Tedrick, married William Cosner in Southern California, and they had three boys, of course, including Kevin. Cosner's a complex character. He wasn't born with a silver spoon in his mouth. His mother was a welfare worker, his father an electrician who became a utilities executive. The family moved a good bit around Southern Cal because of his dad's job advancements, so Kevin had to adjust every time they moved. By his own admission, he wasn't academically inclined. He loved baseball and football, was in the school band and in his Baptist church choir. And along the way, he fell in love with American history big time. Career-wise, Kevin didn't exactly explode onto the Hollywood scene. Who's heard of Sizzle Beach, USA? <laughs> Has anyone seen it? No. no. I haven't. Uh, uh, well, TV like Guide saw it once, <laughs> and they panned it big time. They called it, quote, inept from the opening titles to the closing credits. Well, Costner did not disagree with that once at all, at all. In fact, in the late 1980s, he tried to actually buy the rights to the picture so he could keep it out of the public view. <laughs> he had started making money, and he thought, I need to buy this back and can it, just get rid of it. But the film company that owned the rights declined his offer. 
They instead remarketed it as Cosner's fame grew, blowing Kevin's name up bigger and adding the words Hot Cosner to the original poster and also to the video jacket. Remember videos? Luckily for we history nuts, just four years later, Cosner hit Pater with a breakout role in the popular Western Silverado. Ever since, he has tied his love of history into many of the biggest film successes that he's had. JFK, uh, uh, Dancing with Wolves, of course, has so many others. The Highwayman, uh, more recently. I've got sticky fingers here. Let's see. <coughs> and now, uh, besides the Horizon series that you may have seen advertised on TV, the new Western that Cosner's doing, he is partnered with Morgan Freeman. He's in production on the upcoming The Grey House TV series. It is based on the true story of Elizabeth Van Lu and two other female Union spies who operated out of the rebel capital during the Civil War. They literally operated under the noses of, of Jefferson Davis and the uh, Confederate capital. I was asked to be the historical consultant for this series, which was a lot of fun to get to know, uh, read a Hollywood script and help correct the inaccuracies of the original script. And boy, were there some inaccuracies. <laughs> there were some doozies. Uh, it was also more violent than I'm sure Richmond was, but you know, I guess that's Hollywood. Uh, the series, by the way, debuts uh, the fall of this year, 2024. So keep an eye on that, and uh, it should be coming out sometime in November or October. What's the name of the series called? Uh, it's called The Grey House, House, which was the Confederate capital. Uh, zooming in more on Cosner's family tree, his mother's Mannering line goes back to colonial times, uh, they were Germans who migrated over the generations from the mid-Atlantic to the Midwest, and eventually they moved to California. Here at the upper right on the screen, uh, middle right, uh, you'll see Kevin's sixth great gramps, Jordan Manring. He was a Revolutionary War patriot from Delaware. He was seriously wounded at the Battle of Kings Mountain, a big battle in North Carolina. And then three generations later, if you follow that uh, Sweet 16 bracket to the far left, you'll see Kevin's great great gramps Charles Noel Mannering of the 7th Ohio Cavalry. One of the 7th's first sizable battles was the Battle of Dutton's Hill, Kentucky. It was March 30th, 1863. It was the culmination of Confederate General John Pegram's nine-day foraging expedition to supply Braxton Bragg's Confederate Army of the Tennessee with beef. They stole hundreds of cattle and they were trying to shuffle the herd back to rebel lines. Uh, in pursuit were about 1,200 Union men under the command of General Quincy A. Gilmore. Uh, Pegram chose a defensive position on Dutton's Hill in an effort to protect his stolen cattle, which were then crossing the Cumberland River a mere six miles in Pegram's rear. Well, that night, Pegram did withdraw. He got almost 550 of the 750 cattle that he had actually stolen from, uh, from uh, Kentucky uh, farmers. Among the trophies captured by Cosner's ancestor uh, and the 7th Ohio were three rebel battle flags, always a point of pride to catch a battle flag. From the regimental history, we find this report on the battle noting that the 7th Ohio was especially conspicuous, contributing largely to the victory. So we know Charles Manring was in the Ohio, the 7th Ohio Cavalry. We know he was at the Battle of Dutton's Hill, we think. But how do we know for sure that he was actually present for duty that day? Anybody that does genealogy will tell you that just because some, that your, reg, your ancestor's regiment, history, ancestor was in a regiment doesn't mean he was definitely at the battle. You have to look at the records or get some magical, aha, look at this. Because his own Company M officer told us that he was at the battle many years later, that's how we know. This is gold. This is Charles Manring's lieutenant, Philip Blazer's actual memory which Blazer wrote for the pension office. 
We are about to see that Charles had to fight for a few years to get that pension, but if not for his extra effort to prove his injury, Kevin Cosner would not have this valuable and rather rare testimony when you consider that Mannering was just a private, and so he's less likely to be noted in the uh, reports by the commanders, and he uh, is not going to usually be mentioned in the regimental history. That's unfortunately how it goes when you're a private. Well, Charles, after his horse fell on him, appears to have been on what you might call injured reserve the rest of the war. In other words, he couldn't ride a horse, but he could certainly help with the regiment. He is shown in the records to have continued serving in this unit, so he would have most likely worked in support, uh, support capacity, which is a busy job in a cavalry regiment. They have to get up an hour before everybody else to feed the horses and groom them. And plus, the regiment was in 69 separate engagements, ranging from skirmishes to larger fights and battles in Kentucky, Tennessee, and then on Sherman's Atlanta campaign through Georgia, eventually heading back up into Tennessee to provide valuable service at the famous battles of Franklin and Nashville. Well, all told, 26 of Manring's fellow troopers were killed or mortally wounded in battle, and 197 died of disease or by accidents, which in the cavalry regiment happens a lot, especially uh, to Charles Manring. Luckily, he survived. And a study of this illustration that we have here was shows why Charles needed two strong shoulders to fork a horse. You have to fork a horse with, if you're right-handed, you have to fork a horse with your reins with your left hand and hold your weapon with your right hand. It would be virtually impossible with a dislocated shoulder. Next, we delve into Cosner's Great Gramps' Different War. This is the war to get his pension approved. Like many hundreds of fellow vets, Charles Mannering was denied a pension on his first go-round in 1880 because records could not be located to verify his injuries. Today, we find all kinds of records, but they didn't just automatically appear the day after the war ended. It took years and years and years to compile these records. Okay, now it's 1885. Charles can barely do a man's day's labor with his injured shoulder, yet he is rejected a second time for a pension because he still has no record to be found to prove that a horse fell on him. The government suggests Charles locate a comrade, a commanding officer, or maybe try to find a regimental surgeon that can testify that Charles actually did have a horse fall on him and that he was injured. Finally, 1888 and hallelujah. As we saw earlier, Kevin Cosner's ancestor, uh, his company M. Lieutenant Blazer, is located and gives valuable testimony that Charles really was seriously injured after the Battle of Dutton's Hill. Blazer's letter to the pension office confirms that, quote, after the Battle of Dutton's Hill, Kentucky, while in the line of duty, returning from the pursuit of the enemy, his horse fell on him, severely injuring him, dislocating his left shoulder, disabling him, and rendering him unfit for duty. He was sent to the hospital in Lexington, end quote. Bingo. This is not something you usually find in most Civil War pension files. I would die to have my own ancestor verified at battles like this. So this is really awesome. And it took, what, how many years did we say? Five, six years to actually get someone to testify to that. Meanwhile, about the same time, Charles gets letters from two other former company M messmates, including Private William A. Ferguson, who provides rare detail about the incidents leading up to Charles' injury and to the actual battle itself. Specifics that, though atrociously misspelled, are not even in the official records. Ferguson giving this testimony, and I'll let you read it and enjoy good old elementary school uh, English from the mid-1800s. but it, it gets better. Now we're gonna see even worse English. So, Charles had finally sent everything required to the government. His $12 a month should be arriving any day now, right? Not so fast. The pension office has to first be sure all the I's are dotted 
It was no cakewalk for Charles and honestly thousands of other vets. Uh, I don't think this is the case today. They are a little more efficient, but in those days it took quite a while to get uh, confirmation and start getting your money flowing on a monthly basis. And it would get, it would get his money and eventually his widow's pension. So all this work pays off in the long run. He, uh, here he's fed up with delays and he's demanding in this letter that his pension agent hop to it and darn it, finish the application process, stating that he's tapped out and he actually has to borrow money for postage to send the records they are requesting. And you want to talk about atrocious spelling? <laughs> I'm sure Cosner, if he could put, go back in time, would have gone and helped his, uh, his ancestor, but anyway. Still better writing than my classmates. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I bet. Now, It's 1889, 24 years after he's discharged, 26 years after a horse fell on him. Charles does finally get his monthly pension approved. He is, however, disallowed additional pension pay for his worsening shoulder injury, the result of an 1,100-pound beast falling on him. But apparently, Charles is approved for an increase because of what the doctor, his doctor, called a disease of his testicle. The reason for this disease is listed at the time as from being from the mumps. What? The mumps. Yeah, Joyce is a nurse and I asked her about that too. Uh, moving ahead nine years, it's 1898 and the government is performing a regular review of the pensioner's status. Here we find confirmation that Charles and Anna Manring's son Kevin Cosner's great gramps you'll see in the bottom left there, uh, Julius G, which stands for Grover, that's his middle name, Manring, was born May 14th, 1885. All the other kids in the family are all, uh, Cosner's great uncles and uh, are also noted, providing valuable texture to the Manring story, including that they've now moved from Ohio to Illinois. We can add even more to Cosner's family story in the form of another of these sporadic, uh, per periodic veteran updates that reveal more details of Manring's physical and even his economic situation. Here, his doctor, who has been treating him since 11 years after the war ended, determined Charles now has rheumatism in that injured left shoulder. This is really valuable testimony that will help uh, keep Charles's monthly checks coming. And I'll, I'll let you read that. And here's a gem. Three and a half months after Kevin Cosner's Civil War ancestor dies, the pension board is reviewing possibly increasing his widow Anna's monthly stipend. You can imagine Anna's grief over having to rehash poor Charles's ailments again, and likely adding more grief upon learning, probably for the first time, that a more detailed wartime doctor's report has surfaced showing Charles apparently, several months before they were married, had syphilis towards the end of the war. So maybe it wasn't the mumps as listed for so many years in his medical records. Maybe syphilis was the reason for his longtime, quote, diseased testicle. By the way, uh, nearly 200,000 cases of venereal disease were recorded on the Union side during the war. Well, that's 10% of the Union forces. 130 soldiers actually died of VD, and those are the reported cases. Uh, no, by the way, I didn't tell Kevin that his ancestor apparently had syphilis, but I did send him the information that I'm sharing with you. So he's either already discovered that and hasn't mentioned it, or he will discover it as he goes through these 58 pages, which I sent him as a Christmas present. <laughs> hey, Merry Christmas, right? By the way. <laughs> it was Gary Edelman from the Battlefield Trust that brought this to my attention. I hadn't gone through the files yet, and, uh, and he brought that to my attention. Also, noting here the general affidavit, uh, after Charles dies, his brother Alvin is, uh, is asked to chime in to ensure his brother's wife Anna continues getting a widow's pension. 
So this helps confirm that Charles actually had a brother, uh, and he's living in Perry County, Ohio. And Brother Alvin's statement further enriches Kevin's family story. Alvin confirming that he was at the wedding of his brother in the fall of 1865, and that he'd known Anna Eliza since childhood. And whoa, you look further and you see that Alvin was just a couple years younger than Charles. So did he too serve in the Civil War? He was of the age. I did a little bit of digging, and here he is. I don't know if that's what Cosner's going to look like in another 20 years, but uh, that's Cosner's great granduncle. Uh, Charles's younger brother, Alvin, fought in Sherman's Atlanta campaign in all of the 1864 action, uh, and he mustered out later after the war ended in August of 1865. Well, in our continuing saga of, as the pension office turns, Cosner's great-great-grandmother gets a raise in, eight, in uh, $40 to, uh, a month in 1928. That's two years before uh, her death in 1930. Well, I'm a big fan of making sure people understand what money is worth in a certain era. Today, we look at 40 bucks a month, wow, you know, but it was equal to $720 in those times. So it would have been nothing to sneeze at, uh, and it would have been a great help uh, to the family. So let's get back to the Battle of Dutton's Hill. When I told Kevin about his ancestor fighting there, he kind of chuckled and amusingly said, I play a guy named Dutton in Yellowstone. He kind of like, Dutton's, my ancestor was, was injured at the Battle of Dutton's Hill? Well, today, the battlefield of Dutton's Hill is on private property there in Middle Kentucky. Uh, a historical marker is at the entrance to the four homes, uh, which are at the forefront of the hill where the small battlefield is. Finally, I want to share with you some insight into what makes Kevin Cosner tick. During one of our back and forth emails, he really proved how hooked on history he, he is. Since boyhood, actually, after I discovered and then told Kevin his great gramps was in the Union Cavalry, while my wife Joyce and I were sitting down to watch the Academy Awards about four years ago, I wondered aloud to Joyce if Cosner was attending that night. My answer came about half an hour later. The phone rings. I looked down at it, and what did it say? I showed it to Joyce. I went, it says, incoming call from Kevin Cosner. <laughs> During the Oscars, during the Academy Awards, he had called to thank me for discovering his Civil War ancestor. Then he sent me this email explaining why the Civil War so intrigued him. By the way, you'll notice his email address. I blocked out most of it, but it includes the word crash. Anybody know what movie that's from? What was that from Bull Durham? Bull Durham. He played Crash Davis, a down and out catcher that taught young pitchers to go to the major leagues. He never went to the major leagues, but he, he was a real character in Bull Durham. So that's his part of his email address. And what he said to me in his email was, Shiloh has always struck me because of how the West was won. He's referring to that famous 1860 movie that literally featured every Hollywood actor that was in, of any, any status at all. He mentioned how the character played in the movie by uh, Jimmy Stewart was killed at the Battle of Shiloh. And he added, quote, I remember a line from Spencer Tracy, who narrated the movie. He, Tracy, said, quote, the South never smiled again. I was very moved, Kevin wrote, adding, I was seven years old. I bet a few of us in this room have gotten hooked on history when we were seven years old. Well, I fully expect to see the story of Kevin Cosner's ancestor on one of those genealogy revelation TV shows someday. I mean, how can you top discovering that your great gramps was a Union Army horse trooper just like the one you played in Dances with Wolves? A film that, by the way, won seven of the 12 Oscar nominations it received, including the rare uh, Best Film and Best Director combination in the same year. That almost never happens. And to top it off, guess what? This was his first ever go at being a director. 
Well, Costner's Civil War ancestor, of course, didn't move west to Dakota Territory and live among the Sioux, as is depicted in his movie. Instead, his ancestor lived out the rest of his days in the Midwest, in Illinois, where he's buried. And that, my friends, is the story of how art can sometimes imitate life, and how I think it is safe to say that we have a great friend in history, of American history, in Kevin Costner. Thank you. I do have three more slides, but first I want to open up the talk to uh, any questions you might have. I have a couple. Yeah. Um, when he finally got his pension, was that retroactive? Uh, no. No. Uh, In those days, they didn't do that. That's all. They should have. <laughs> yeah. they, did, they, did, yeah. they didn't do that. Yeah. Now, also, Grey House. Uh, you said that you... Ah. There were some discrepancies. Could yeah, no, elaborate? this is a doozy. This is a doozy. I mentioned, the, as I read the script, uh, uh, which is really cool to read a Hollywood script, to see two very famous uh, writers uh, that have done a, n a number of stuff produce this. Um, they, they have quite a bit more violence than you're going to normally, uh, you would have seen in Richmond. Uh, and again, I chalked it up to Hollywood. But um, uh, that's a great question because, for one thing, Al, they had uh, John Wilkes Booth, living in Richmond the entire war. Well, John Wilkes Booth never lived in Richmond uh, during the Civil War. He, uh, he was in D.C. He was a very famous actor, and he roamed around D.C. stewing about the fact that his southern brethren were you know, not doing so well towards the end of the war. Uh, also, they put, in 1862, there's a scene where they have Ulysses S. Grant uh, commanding the Army of the Potomac. And as we all know, in 1862, he was at Fort Donaldson, Shiloh, uh, you know, Chicka uh, not Chickamauga, but uh, Vicksburg. Uh, so I told the writers, I said, it's not any skin off your nose to just make this correct. And they agreed. They agreed that, you know, why would you say Grant's here when he, when he really wasn't? Um, uh, there's another scene uh, where also 1862, that same segment, I think it's the second se uh, segment in the series of three, they have... Now tell me why this is wrong. They have a bunch of black Union uh, POWs in 1862 marching through the streets of Richmond. There were no black soldiers at right. that time. Right. <laughs> Spring of 1863 is when we start to see the, uh, the black, uh, eventually almost 200,000 African American soldiers come along. So that's just a few of the, of the things that, uh, that uh, uh, I called them on. There was a bunch of other, there was 20 things that I mentioned that you got, got you get right around this. One more I'll tell you, the Battle of Ball's Bluff, late uh, fall of uh, 1861, early in the war, Verina Davis, the Confederate uh, uh, president's uh, wife, they're in the White House of the Confederacy, the Gray House, uh, they called it the White House of the Confederacy. Verina Davis is talking with uh, Van Lu, the woman who is a spy, living right overlooking that White House of the Confederacy. She's a very well placed. Her husband was very well to do before he died. And, uh, but no one really liked her because she was openly sympathetic to the Union. She helped the Libby uh, prisoners at Libby Prison uh, and uh, gave them food and books to read. <coughs> In their conversation, uh, Verona Davis says to Van Lu, Mrs. Van Lu, how about our, our Southern boys, kill, uh, we, we took down, uh, we." got rid of a thousand, got killed a thousand uh, Union troops at Ball's Bluff. Well, really it was about 120 uh, Union troops died. And so I said, you know what? The total casualties were a thousand. And they make that mistake also. They say 50,000 uh, uh, will end up dying in the Civil War. Uh, I'm sorry, at Gettysburg, which as we know, it was 50,000 casualties, actually 51,000. That was 7,000 were killed. But oftentimes, people that aren't uh, familiar with the casualty list, they think 51,000 kill uh, at Gettysburg means kill. So they use that number, so I brought that to their attention too. Denzel Washington made that mistake in Remember the Titans. Not a Civil War movie, a great football movie, but uh, he's watching his boys running through the, uh, the uh, Gettysburg College for a summer camp for football when he yells, 50,000 men didn't die in this field for you guys to wimp out this morning. And uh, turns out it, it was 50,000 casualties. 
So anyway, that was just some of the things, and it was fun to, to poke a few holes. Yeah, do, Gail? Do they care about changing it? Because a lot of times you see a movie and people think that what's in the movie is the true history. But yes. a lot of times many liberties are taken. You like know, they might want to have, you know. We'll books. find out this fall. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I, do, I just told them, yeah, yeah, uh, Colonel. Did, did he have any inkling about his uh, relatives? He, he did one? not know anything about this particular one. His cousin, um, actually I'm glad you mentioned that because I'm going to, you just led into my next slide. Uh, wow, we should work together here. Um, uh, but he did not know anything. Uh, you'll soon see that he, uh, he might know about the next ancestor I'm going to show you. Um, but, uh, but he did not know anything about Tedrick, his Union 111th uh, Illinois uh, ancestor, was on the Atlanta campaign. A lot of battles. And of course his great aunt, grand uncle, uh, Charles Mannering's brother, he was on the Atlanta campaign. So, um, you know, he didn't know. He didn't know about it. And I don't, I think he's too busy right now to really get into it because Gary Edelman told me, I will take Cosner to Dutton's Hill and give him a personal tour of, uh, of the battle. I mean, wouldn't that be cool? But, you know, someday Cosner will slow down. He's not slowing down right now. He's my, he's 68 now, and, uh, and he's not slowing down. But, um, oh, go ahead. Yeah, Gail? I mean, uh, Lori? Uh, so did you get an invite to Santa Barbara for your next vacation? Go, what? <laughs> so Going to Santa Barbara. Oh, Santa, yeah, right. I don't, I don't know if you let me in the gate there, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I want to know what you connect. Do you still have an ongoing connection? I don't have a connection with him. The, the company, uh, uh, he's he's one of the three partners with uh, with Audio, yeah. so he's involved with the three, the two other founders, uh, actively involved with them, but um, so but I haven't been in touch with him. Uh, uh, I haven't really had a need to contact him. I did ask his agent if I could give this talk. And, uh, and uh, so, you know, that's, that's as far as I've gone, so. How long, how ongoing is your connection with doing the markers, the markers in the, throughout the country? Uh, an ongoing connection with who? Doing, doing the, the markers. markers. The for here, for here, for here. Oh, 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 the audio company. Yeah. Uh, well, that was, I was uh, in on the ground floor with that, and so was Joyce. Joyce and I both put together the whole template with the, uh, one of the founders for creating the 10,000 first stories. And I, I'm not doing anything with them right now, although we did just go represent them at a, the Texas Historical Society Conference uh, last month mm -hmm. in, uh, in College Station, Texas, which was pretty cool. They had a, uh, we gave a symposium on, uh, on, on, Technology and history, you know, make, keeping up with technology to make sure that young people uh, uh, also get excited about history. So, how much is that app? It's a uh, thirty-nine bucks a month. Uh -huh. I wish they would do it for free, like Waze does. Yeah, it's but, um, a year. Uh, but I, I'm sorry, I'm a sorry, a year, year. thirty-nine yeah. a year. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. 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 So it would be nice to have. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's wonderful. And actually, we used it for our trip. When Joyce and I took our cross-country trip, I use it to suss out ahead of time routes that you can take. Yeah, yeah. Like Newburyport, because of Bill, Bill wrote a number of Newburyport, you know, Bill wrote the history of Civil War in Newburyport. So a number of our Newburyport stories, Bill's written some of those. And I suspect he's narrated them. I'm not sure, actually. But um, anyway... But let me get uh, uh, our colonel of the state troopers here, a retired colonel. Uh, I want to get uh, your, it's, uh, I've got a, an answer for you here. Uh, I probably should have quit doing uh, research on Costner's family at this point because it gets even more interesting and more complex. I found online that Kevin's cousin has done extensive digging into their mutual Costner line. Uh, not the Mannering line, his mother's, but his father's line. Turns out Kevin's ancestor on his dad's side was a rebel uh, during the Civil War. His name was, get this, John Andrew Jackson Cosner. That's a great name. Who bears, I think, a slight resemblance to Kevin. Is that a beard or a shirt? It's, it's, it's like an Amish beard. It, yeah, nice. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's like a clump of hair. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, now, his ancestors survived uh, several battles under Robert E. Lee. Uh, none of his ancestors fought each other. I did not find any point where the ancestors fought each other. Um, 
But uh, his ancestor in the Confederacy, uh, their regiment suffered 46% casualties at Gettysburg. And going further back, Kevin's sixth great-grandfather on the far right there, uh, German-born Philip Peter Kastner, the original German name was K-A-S-T-N-E-R, uh, became Kastner, uh, was a loyalist. He fought for the British uh, during the American Revolution. And family lore from Kevin's cousin that I found is that Kosner's ancestor, Peter, was killed by his own brother, Kevin's great-granduncle, Thomas Kasner, who was a patriot, at the Battle of Ramser's Mill in 1870, uh, 1780 uh, in North Carolina. Well, Thomas is recorded as having buried his own brother, Peter, after the battle. Uh, Uncle Thomas then went on in October of that same year to fight with the Patriots at the Battle of Kings Mountain, where, as you might recall earlier, uh, I mentioned that Causer's ancestor on his mom's mannering side was also seriously wounded. Two shorties, uh, I gotta uh, pass this on about uh, uh, the cavalry, what I learned about the cavalry. Uh, and I love giving talks to you guys because I learned so much. Uh, a little cavalry tidbit that I learned is that uh, uh, the, the reason that they, the cavalry uses such small flags, anybody want to guess? Uh, if you can imagine, you, you know how big an infantry uh, flag is. It's, as, it's, that, it's, it's almost twice as big as that screen. Three by five. Mm -hmm. imagine, uh, imagine being a, a stanchion of a cavalry a flag bearer and a 20 knot oh, gust hits you. <laughs> While you're galloping, you know how fast is a horse gallop? 25 miles an hour. Imagine galloping at 25 miles an hour with an in, a giant flag and a gust hits you, you're gone. Uh -huh. So ever since the ancient European uh, cavalry developments, they developed what was called a, 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 a swallow's tail guiding. It's called a guiding. And the guidings are like swallowtail shaped to bleed the wind off. And they're also only like this big. So. <laughs> So that's, uh, that's a little tidbit that I learned uh, uh, for you guys. Uh, finally, also, the 7th Ohio was lucky. They had what was called the 5th model Burnside carbine. Uh, these carbines, everybody wanted these things. They were single shot rifles, but they were breech loading. So you, can you imagine loading a musket from a horse? Uh, you know, ramrodding it and the whole bit. Uh, so these rifles, uh, they were designed to eject the bullet with a lever action from the trigger, and it also automatically popped off the brass firing cap in the same motion to receive a new firing cap and make uh, firing much more rapid from a horse. Now the, 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 stock, the barrel is shorter. They are rifle, so they do have accurate range and they do go a pretty good distance. Uh, but only about 200 yards. So a cavalry engagement has to be pretty close in. The infantry, what's the distance of an infantry run, infield or a spring field? 600 yards. Yeah, like four to 600 is what you're gonna find uh, because they're much longer. So anyway, so there you go. There's a little worthless information for your next trivia, uh, maybe our next Jeopardy. So, anyway, thank you very much for coming out here.